Hello and welcome back to the Jet Press YouTube channel. My name is Justin Freed, and I'm joined once again today by New York Jets punter Thomas Morstead. Thomas, what's going on, man? How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Justin. Of course. Always love having you on the show. Uh, so, you know, we, we've had you on a, a few times already, and I, I know you've also been doing the media rounds this week. Of course, you're here because we want to get you to the Pro Bowl. That's That's the goal here, and I promise we will get to that. But first... I kind of want to switch things up. You know, we've had you on a few times. I've asked you a lot of the, you know, the normal questions, Aaron Rodgers, all this stuff. If you're cool with it, I'd love to kind of take a look back on your career chronologically. And I'm not just talking like your NFL career. I mean, your entire football journey. Is that is that cool with you? Yeah, sure. Great, because those are the questions that I have prepared. So I'm glad you're cool with that. Uh, let's start at the very beginning, because I feel like something a lot of jazz fans don't realize, and I know I didn't realize this until I was doing research, is that your your parents weren't born in the United States, right? They were they were born in the UK. So, like, how did that my impact? Mom. Yeah. Your yeah mom, my mom. Yes. How did that impact your exposure to American football and, and other sports at a young age? Um, well, my dad's from Louisiana originally, but uh, moved around. He was in Argentina for a little bit when he was a kid and then moved to England for a good chunk of his childhood. Um, yeah, I mean, I got thrown in soccer first, you know, first sport. And uh, um, <clears throat> my dad was a pro cyclist, so kind of grew up watching that as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, I kind of played, did everything other other than baseball. That was the only sport I didn't play growing up, but did basketball, um, obviously did football, but soccer was my main gig, you know, from four years old through all the way through uh, high school. So, um, yeah, I mean, they just threw me in soccer and I, you know, I fell in love with it. And, um, you know, although I kind of dabbled in other things, I kind of, I wasn't always looking to try the new thing. Like soccer was my jam and, uh, and I was all in on it for a long time. What is it that made you decide to give football a try? Because I mean, you also played basketball, I think, as well. Uh, and obviously, soccer was your love. So what what kind of <clears throat> you football eventually? Um, well, that's a long story. Uh, so basically, I, I, you know, I went out for football in seventh grade and had a fun experience. Eighth grade, I was on the A team, just kicking only. I was specializing at that young of an age. And then... Um, when I got to high school, I made 18 and, uh, in ninth grade and, and, uh, broke my leg in two places on the first play of a first scrimmage of ninth grade. And I was a pretty small, ki a really small kid, to be honest. Um, and, um, didn't, you know, I was like, man, this is tough. I can't protect myself. I was getting hit a lot and I was so small and I don't know, I just wasn't enjoying it. So I didn't play anymore and I just stuck to soccer. And, um, you know, when I went in high school, I weighed about 90 pounds. Um, and I was about five foot zero. And by the end of high school, I was six, four hundred and eighty pounds. So I doubled my weight in four years, um, and grew a lot, obviously. Um, and I just decided my, you know, I, I got, I got cut from my soccer team, my junior year of high school and didn't understand why. And, you know, I'd scored a lot of goals the year before and kind of had a little, you know, conflict with coach that I didn't realize was a thing. And anyways, I, that kind of spurred me to at least go out for the football team my senior year. Cause I knew soccer was kind of out of the picture. And, um, by that time I'd grown and I had a pretty good year and, you know, didn't think anything of it. And, um, after the season ended, I had three coaches pull me out of class for different, uh, schools that were in the area recruiting to talk to me about walking on and, that kind of was like, oh wow, maybe I could, maybe I could do that in college. So, I really started dedicating myself to it, and um, you know, went to walk on at SMU, and you know, um, discovered the weight room, and uh, <clears throat> you know, the rest is history, I guess. It's funny how little things like that, like getting cut from your your high school soccer team, could eventually lead to your your enti entire life path, essentially your journey to this point. Um, yeah. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that recruiting process because it's it's an interesting one for you because you had basically one year of tape to show schools. Now it was a great year. You know, you were all district. I believe you were your county's special teams MVP. Like it was a great year. But what was that recruiting process like for you? I know you eventually chose SMU, but there were other schools in the mix. I think I read Texas was out there. Rice. No, 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 no. That that gets blown out. Those, those were yeah. that's where 
that's where I was considering attending college. There, oh, okay. there was, there was zero recruiting. Um, <laughs> I had missed the boat on that and I was, you know, pretty unimpressive. Um, as far as, you know, what people would be looking for at that point, you know, like I said, I never touched the weight. Um, I think my 40 yard dash was like a five, four, like, I mean, I was, you know, breaking both bones in my left leg and growing 16 inches in four years, like did not help. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I did well, but I, I could hit spirals that turned over and we had a lot of fair catches, which you don't see in high school. At least back then we punted pro style. So it wasn't this kind of spread formation where everybody ran down the field. Um, and my, my high school coach who was, you know, his name was Tony Heath, uh, you know, straight shooter, not a bullshitter at all. Was like, I really think you could become a good player if you wanted to. Like, you have, I think I had the things that you can't work on, right? I had a long leg and technically was pretty good. Um, and the things that you needed to work on, which was getting stronger and more explosive, that was something that I could, you could still develop, right? Um, and so he just kind of encouraged me and, and I fell into a good situation at SMU because they couldn't field, at the time, they couldn't field you know, uh, they had tr trouble fielding walk-ons, um, just such a small school. And, uh, my coach thought I'd kind of get washed out of the big state school. And so it just was a perfect situation where I could walk on SMU. And as long as I showed up and didn't, you know, and took it serious, like they were going to let me be on the team, you know? And so, um, I just did that. And, um, you know, I kind of, I fell in love with all the, the working out and getting stronger. It gave me confidence and, um, you know, it just kind of, you know, was, uh, I don't know. It just kind of, it just kind of happened. Um, it wasn't forced. I just fell in love with it. And, and by the end of my second year, I mean, I was all in on it. Um, training like a madman and, um, just wanted to see how far I could take it. How much of your decision to attend SMU was, was <laughs> on the fact that you can walk on there and, and, and maybe make the team. How, how much of that decision can I, I know you said you weren't really recruited. So did you decide to go there because you're like, Hey, maybe I can, you know, walk on a football team or was there, were there other stuff too? Well, the, the issue with SMU at the time was, and it's, it would still be an issue today was it was the most expensive private school in Texas at the time. And so the, the tuition was, was the issue. And, and I actually earned an engineering scholarship to go there. And so that engineering scholarship made it comparable to going to a University of Texas or a Texas A&M financially. And so when that became the case, that it was going to cost the same, but I knew the opportunity would be there as long as I kind of did what I was supposed to do, showed up when I was supposed to show up, that I, I knew they weren't going to like have me do a one day tryout and like, be like, beat it kid, you know, like they were going to let me be a part of it and let me have a chance to grow. And I remember at that time thinking that's valuable because I knew going to some of these other places they have just even being able to get out there for a tryout is like hard enough. And uh, they just kind of let me be a part of it. And so at the time it just, it was, you know, call it luck, um, you know, whatever you want to call it. I was very fortunate to kind of have that understanding and to have the awareness to understand that I was not ready to play and I needed some time to develop and that that's what they were going to give me. Yeah. And then you, you had that time, but you eventually took the field and your, your, I guess, college career took off. At what point during your time at SMU, during your time in college, did you start to realize that, all right, maybe this could be something I do at the next level? Because it's one thing to take that leap from high school to college, but to, from college to the NFL, that's a completely different animal. So when did you start to realize that maybe this is something you can make a job out of? Um, you know, I remember thinking I could play pro ball in my second year before I had even earned my scholarship, I was last on the depth chart and I had not really gotten any reps, but I remember thinking I knew how raw I was from the developmental side. Like, you know, a lot of kids that get, they get scholarships because of the top, the cream of the crop physically in high school. And I was opposite. And, uh, but I could, hit, I knew technically I was good enough already to, to be pretty good, but I just needed to get stronger and just keep getting, you know, just keep getting stronger, more explosive. And, um, so my second year was when I first kind of thought it, um, I remember at the end of my third year, which was my first year playing on full ride scholarship at the end of the season, I remember thinking nobody that we punted that we played that year, there were 12 teams. 
I felt like nobody was better than me in those 12 teams that we played. And I said, okay, I must be pretty good. And then at the end of my junior year, uh, we were one and 11 and we had the second highest net upon average in the, in college football. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm, I think I've got to be, you know, right up there. And then um, over the summer between my junior and senior year, I found out that there was a thing called the National and the Blesto Scouting Report that the NFL uses, these two scouting services, and that I was the number one rated specialist on both of those lists coming out for the next year's draft. And I was like, wow, I had no idea. And um, that just kind of, that gave me a lot of confidence because I felt like I was going to be a guy, but you don't know. And seeing that was uh, validated kind of how I'd been feeling. So. Yeah, I mean, and then, of course, you go into the draft, and in 2009, you end up getting selected fifth round by the Saints. Uh, obviously, you, you got to see those scouting reports. So is this a situation where you went into the draft kind of expecting to be picked? Because obviously, a lot of specialists aren't drafted. So did you go into that draft with a good idea that you might be picked? Yeah, my agent at the time, uh, Van McElroy, he um, sat me down the day before the draft and said, hey, I think you're going to go to the four, four, in the fourth or fifth round to the Colts of the Saints. And mm. um, the Saints picked me in the fifth, and then the Colts ended up drafting McPhee um, out of West Virginia. So um, he was pretty spot on with his intel. I, I mean, I'd say it worked out for both teams at that point. <laughs> uh, I was, yeah, I was going to ask. So it was Colts or Saints? Because I was going to ask you. I know it's been a while, but were there any other teams besides the Colts or Saints that were interested? Or was it just like the Colts and the Saints, they were the, the two top teams? Uh, no, I worked out for the... Uh, Green Bay Packers. I worked out for the Houston Texans, uh, Philadelphia Eagles. And actually, when when I got the phone call on draft day, um, the Eagles were on the clock. And so they had four fifth-round picks, and I thought they, they were on the clock. And I'm like, all right, here, here it goes. And I had no idea that 504 area code was New Orleans and picked up, and it was general manager, Mickey Loomis, who's still there, actually just won his 200th uh, career game as general manager. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a cool experience, you know, it only happens once if it happens and, uh, you know, I'll never forget it. Yeah. And then <laughs> you get to New Orleans and your first year in the league, you win a Super Bowl, right? It's like for a lot of guys, it takes years to get to that point. Some never even get there. So what was that like, like coming straight into the NFL and then immediately reaching like the, the pinnacle of the sport? All I can say is that whole season was magic. Um, you know, it's impossible to appreciate it the way you should uh, when you just get thrust right into it as a first year. Um, so I tried my best to soak it in and, and to try to appreciate it. But you really you really can't until you've, you know, I was watching guys that had played. Mark Brunel was in his 20th season as our backup quarterback and holder on field goals. And uh, Jason Kyle was in his 16th year. John Carney was in his 21st year kicker. Um, just watched some of those guys celebrate who had never done it. And uh, I remember thinking, man, I, I can't possibly feel the elation that these guys feel. They've been chasing this their whole career. So um, if I ever get back, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be different uh, in a cool way. So. Definitely. I mean, look, we could hope it's this year, maybe next year. If, if you're coming back with the team, I hope you are. You know, I, yep. I, I would love to see a scenario where, you know, it's been, I mean, that'd be like what, 15, 16 years at that point between Super Bowl wins. I can't imagine there are many guys in the league in the history of the league who have gone like that big of a gap between winning Super Bowls. <laughs> so that, that would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll see. Hope, hoping for the best. Yeah. I, in that game, obviously, you probably know what I'm going to ask about. You were involved in one of the most important and memorable plays of that game. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the onside kick at the beginning of the second half. Now, I'm sure you've been asked about that play a lot over the years. So I'm not going to you know, bother you with the specifics of the play. But I am curious about how you got the job as the kickoff guy to begin with, because I'm pretty sure you didn't do that in college. So how did you end up in a position where you're a rookie punter and you're the kickoff guy and then eventually – you, you get to the Super Bowl, you're kicking off in the Super Bowl and involved in one of the most important plays of the game. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, Garrett Hartley was our kicker. He was in his second year. And in training camp, he had got a some sort of suspension for something. 
Um, and so they signed John Carney, who's in his 21st season, I think. And John, you know, was in his forties and, and, you know, his kickoff leg wasn't what it used to be. And, uh, and I just, you know, I was looking to find more roles for myself other than just punting. Cause I was hoping to, you know, and you know, if you can do two jobs, great, it's even more job security. And, uh, and John, I think was excited about the prospect to me kicking off. Cause if he could make all his field goals, um, then maybe he'd stick around longer. So, um, the last week of preseason, they let me kick one and, and then they told me the week, the, the week of the first game of my career, Hey, we're going to roll with you at kickoff. And, uh, by the end of that four week suspension, I was pretty grooved on, on being a touchback guy and, and being able to kick it deep and, um, never gave the job back up. So, um, yeah. So when we did that in the Super Bowl, I was obviously first time for me doing that a little bit of anxiety, if you want to call it that. Um, but it was a cool experience for sure to be able to do it. I would say it worked out. I would say that they probably don't regret the decision uh, to to allow you to do that. Uh, for the sake of brevity, you know, we don't need to go through every moment of your NFL career. I don't, I don't think we have time for that. But I do want to ask you about the 2012 season because you know that summer you're handed your first big contract, your first big extension, second highest paid punter in the league, and then you go on to have the best year of your career, make the Pro Bowl. What was it like to receive? all of that recognition within pretty much like six to seven months, you know, you got paid, you received your, the awards and honors. What was all that like? Um, it was, I mean, look, getting a big contract is great. Um, and you know, it was a weird season because coach Payton was suspended. Um, the whole bounty gate deal and, um, our team didn't do as well as we'd historically done. And so it was just kind of strange. Um, but I had a great experience going to the Pro Bowl. Uh, it was an awesome thing for me personally. And and there were some teammates who went with me as well that year. And it was just cool to be around the best of the best, to be honored. It was really a, a neat deal. Um, but, you know, the the year before, I thought I should have gone. And the year after, I thought I should have gone as well. And and it's just, you know, it's, it's hard to get in. You know, they only take one guy. So um, didn't feel like the season was astronomically different from the previous season. Um, but I finally got the nod and it was uh, it was a great experience. Yeah. And that, and that brings us to today because Thomas, you know, it's, it's been 11 years since you last made the Pro Bowl since that 2012 season. Uh, you've been a Pro Bowl alternate countless times. You've continuously been snubbed. I, I know I speak for a lot of Jets fans when I say you absolutely deserve to be there this year. I'm sure I speak for a lot of your teammates as well and other guys around the league. So in your own words, what would it mean for you to finally make it back to the Pro Bowl this season over a decade after you last made it? Uh, it'd be great. Um, you know, it's not um, it's not about the time gap. It's, you know, three years ago getting released and having a tough injury. Nobody would sign me just because they thought I was done, washed up, whatever. And to be able to kind of get back to where I'm at now, really proud of that. And so um the result of making the pro bowl would kind of just be icing you know it'd be cherry on top type of thing um but I, I don't think that um that uh you know that title or, or winning that accolade would change how anybody feels um i know it certainly wouldn't change how i felt about this season um i'm really proud of it regardless of how it goes so but it would be a cool honor for sure yeah, I, I think regardless of whether you make it or not, I, I think that the Jets fans and a lot of people around the league, uh, I, I think, realize how great you are in that. And, you know, definitely you're not washed or whatever. You're not over the hill. A few years ago, that's long gone. I think you've proved your point by this point. Uh, and I hope you make it. I, I definitely do. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. And we'll see, see what happens. happens. Yeah. And Jets fans, if you guys want to vote for Thomas Morrison to make the Pro Bowl, which you absolutely should, uh, I'll plug it right now. Literally just you can Google NFL Pro Bowl voting, click the first link. Uh, that link will also be in the description of this video below. You can also tweet the name Thomas Morrison, include the hashtag Pro Bowl vote on Twitter or X or whatever you call it. Uh, you know, let's let's do everything we can to get this man into Pro Bowl because he absolutely deserves it. And yeah, man, that's that's pretty much all I got. As always, Thomas, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Any final words for Jets fans out there who are, who are showing their support and trying to get you to Orlando? No, look, I really appreciate it. I felt the love all season and, um, you know, keep the faith. It's, I know it's been a rocky season, but, um, 
I'm proud to be a part of this group we got. It's been a lot of fun being a part of this team. And, um, you know, you just got to hang in there. And uh, I know everybody has. And uh, just felt great to win last week. So hopefully we keep it rolling this week. Definitely. Hopefully we can get you to Pro Bowl this year. And then hopefully maybe we can get you to the Super Bowl again next year. That would be that would be ideal. That would be awesome. Uh, Jets fans, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. I've been Justin Freed. That has been Thomas Morstead. We'll see you guys next time.